Welcome to Walking by Faith. I'm Anna. Today we're continuing enforcing justice with our message, Promise Keeper. But before we get started, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you know when new content is available. Now, let's get started. Well, we're going to jump right back in to our message from last week. And I'm going to go over a few things again because this is so fundamental. It's so important. And so many of us do not know this, this stuff, all right? So God creates man and woman, puts them in the garden, uh, Genesis 2.15, to guard, to tend, and to keep it. Uh, Satan comes in, tempts Adam and Eve. Now, what God did when he created Adam and Eve, uh, Genesis 1 says he gave them dominion. In Psalms 8, it says he put all things under their feet. Uh, in Romans, in the New Testament, the fifth chapter, the 17th verse, I, I love this verse, particularly in the Weymouth translation. It says, for if through the transgression of one individual, death made use of the one individual to seize the sovereignty. Death made use of the one individual to seize the sovereignty. So literally what happened is Satan took man's sovereignty, man's authority, right? And began to use that authority. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, the Bible calls Satan the God of this world. Jesus said the prince of this world is coming, speaking of Satan. 1 John 5, 19, we know positively that we're of God and the whole world around us is under the control of the devil. Is that pretty clear? People say, well, if God's in control, why this? The whole world around us is under the control of the devil. He sees the sovereignty. Now, one of the things that we've been talking about is that the Bible is written about two people, really. It's your connection to two people. Both of them are named Adam. The first one lived with Eve in a garden. God created Adam as a prototype. He put everything in Adam that he wanted for you and for me. The problem is this. Adam reproduced not in the condition that God created him, but in the condition that he fell to. Sin, sickness, death, disease, all these things came in, right? And he reproduced in that condition. Uh, I don't know exactly how they do it nowadays, but... Uh, in, in years past, before we really had the internet, we would use tapes and we would use discs, CD discs. And uh, you, could, you would come to a service like this and they'd be recording it. And then as soon as, the, as we said, amen, they would take that thing as the master and they would make duplicates. In five minutes after the service, you could walk out there and get a duplicate. Now, if the master was bad, you know what was the problem with the duplicate? It was bad, all right? Well, God made a master copy in Adam, but he went bad. And because he went bad, you went bad. Because he lost the sovereignty, you lost the sovereignty. The condition that he fell into is the condition that he reproduced in. He was the first representative man. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that God sent a last Adam, a second representative man. The first man, it says, was of the earth. It's Adam. But the last Adam is the Lord from heaven, right? The last Adam is Jesus. God sent Jesus as a representative man. And when Jesus went to the cross, he represented you. He took your condition to the cross. And he died representing you, representing your condition. But he paid for your condition, and he was buried, and he rose again. Now, he didn't, you, you, you don't just identify with him in his death, but also in his resurrection. Because the Bible says that you were buried with him, that you were raised with him, and you were seated with him. And just like you had the exact condition of the first Adam, 
you now have that condition in the second Adam or the last Adam. So the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Now, to be in Christ, it literally is a technical term in all of Paul's epistles. In Christ, in him, in whom? And it literally means that Jesus took you to the cross and you died with him. Galatians 2.20 said, Paul said, my old man was crucified with Christ. You were crucified with him. You were buried with him, but you're raised with him. And you're seated together with him in heavenly places, right? And your condition now is to be his condition. So when you get right with God, you get changed. If anyone is in Christ, not in church, you can be in church and be a mess. You can be in church and not be in Christ. But if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. Not you're going to be. Not you're trying to be. Not someday you hope to get there. But if you are in Christ, you are. You are a new creation. Old things have passed. Your connection to Adam passed away. And all these things are of God. I went to church for 20 years. Um, it never penetrated. Uh, I went to church. I believed in God. Uh, I thought he was mad. Seriously, I thought he was mad. I thought he didn't want me. I'm 20 years old. I go to a service kind of like this, a lot smaller, and afterwards, Bruce Roberts came up and talked to me and shared a couple of verses out of Romans 10. I got down on my knees, I prayed, got up, really didn't feel anything different. I do remember we had a friend. He had been his friend before. He was my friend at the time, and I was attending Kelvin College at the time. And all of us kind of, we got together at one corner of the third floor of the library every morning. So he said to me, Bruce did, after we prayed, he said, now, when you see your, your, our friend tomorrow, you tell him you got saved. So the next morning, I go up to the, the, the library at Calvin College, and there's my friend. And I go over, and, and I said to him, I said, uh, I want you to know that last night I got saved. Do you know we were never friends again? <laughs> now, here's what I want you to understand. All the stuff that I used to like to do, I didn't want to do anymore. And all the stuff I used to didn't like, I liked. It was, it was really weird. Now, I remember we would go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night. But we would come home on Sunday night. And we had this great big, I don't even know what you call it anymore. But it was a TV. It was an AM, FM radio and a record player. I remember one of those things. All right, you are all old people, old people, all right? So we would come home from church on Sunday night. My dad would go over there and put that thing on WFUR, all right? That's the religious station for those of you who didn't know. But not really the religious, it was the old hymn station. And, and he was in World War II, and he shot his gun too many times because he couldn't hear real well. And he would crank that sucker up. And I remember going in my bedroom, taking my pillow and putting it over my ears and just going, I hate that song, I hate that song, I hate that song, I hate that song. But now, now I'm a new creature. You know what I wanted to do? I just wanted to get around people and sing praises to God. You know, all the stuff that I didn't want to do before, I wanted to do. And all the stuff that I didn't want, this is right. I wanted to do what I didn't want to do and the stuff that I, anyway, I was all different. I mean, a new creature, a new creation. Now listen, when you get born, when, when you get in Christ, you get ruined for sinning because you don't enjoy it anymore because there's something on the inside of you that wants to do the will of God. 
That's why the Bible says, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Because if you're in Christ and you're not following Christ, you're just miserable. You may as well be a sinner because if you're a sinner, you can sin and enjoy it. But once you're in Christ, you cannot enjoy it anymore. You are a new creation. One translation actually says a new species of being that never was before. So Adam and Eve, they sin. They lose their dominion. Satan literally takes the opportunity to seize the sovereignty. And in a real way, God is on the outside looking in. He finds a man by the name of Abram. And he says to him, this is Genesis 12, verse 2, I will make you a great nation, nation of Israel. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. God's foreign policy, I will bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. And then this last phrase, it's referred to in the New Testament. And it says the gospel was preached to Abraham. This is where the gospel is preached to Abraham. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. It is a promise of the Messiah, the seed of the woman, the one who's going to take the sovereignty back from the devil. So he makes him that promise. Well, Abraham, at one point, he's, he's in his 90s now and, and no children. And he says, God, how am I going to know? And God tells him to take some animals, split them in half, and they make a covenant. Not a contract, but they make a covenant agreement. Now, here's what the Bible says here in Genesis chapter, tw chapter uh, 22, where he has to confirm the covenant. So they make the covenant, by the way. God the Father, God the Son walk through the pieces. They make promises to each other, right? Um, those promises are found in the New Testament, and we're going to get into those in the weeks ahead. One of them, Jesus actually refers to as the promise of the Father. This is where it came from, Genesis 15. You'll find it in the New Testament multiple times. The promise of the Father, which is the promise of the Holy Spirit coming upon you to empower you. But all of the in Christ, in him, in whom, those are the promises that are made. So, Abraham makes this covenant that literally God the Father, God the Son show up. It tells us in the New Testament into Abraham, into his seed were the promises made. Not seeds as of many, but seed as of one who is Christ. So literally, God the Father, God the Son come down, Genesis chapter 15, and they, they make this, this, this covenant agreement, and it's Jesus and God the Father, and Abraham is represented by his seed, Jesus. Now, God promises, first of all, in Genesis 3.15, that the Redeemer is going to come through a woman. He's first of all called the seed of the woman. Then he's called the seed of Abraham. And then later, the seed of David. God gets more and more specific about how the promise is going to come into the world. So the promise is made, God the Father, God the Son. In Galatians 3.29, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So all the promises that were made, God the Father, God the Son, you become an heir of those promises. In Genesis 22, God tests Abraham. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Now, he wasn't just a test. It was a test if he would do what he needed to do to uphold the covenant. It's a test of the covenant. And again, most of us enter into one covenant in our entire lifetime, and that's the covenant of marriage. Now, the two become, become one. And everything that belongs to the one belongs to the, the other one. So God is testing Abraham to see if he will uphold his end of the covenant. 
He says, take your son, go to Mount Moriah and offer him to me there as a sacrifice. So the Bible says early the next morning, Abraham gets up, takes his son, a couple of the servants, and they take a three-day journey and they get to Mount Moriah. Again, we've got a picture. This is where this took place. Today, if you were to go there, it's on the Temple Mount. Uh, this is taken right across the little Kidron Valley. Right? We're on Mount Scopus, and this is the picture that you'll see. And under that gold dome, that gold dome was built in the seventh century when the Muslims conquered the, prom the, 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 the land of Israel. They built that dome, and it is built on the spot. Doesn't matter if you're a Jewish, Christian, Muslim, everybody knows that right there is the spot where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son. Again, if you could make the walls disappear and then the wall that you see, that eastern wall of, of the city, of the, the temple, literally it's the temple mount, if you could make it disappear, it's probably a half a mile to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place where Jesus is crucified. It's right there. Now, Abraham had to be willing to give his son. You say, why? Because God was going to give his son. That's why. And that's why Abraham said that day, he said, Jehovah Jireh. And how many of you remember, anybody here used to sing that song? Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I know you don't want me to sing. All right. I'll remind you, the reason I never sing is because they asked me to quit the volunteer choir in the fifth grade. I know that this is not my gift. But when we talk, you know, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Well, actually what he said, the Lord will, in this mountain, it will be provided. On Mount Moriah, where Abraham was going to offer his son, God was going to offer his son. But Abraham had to be willing. So the test was not just a test, are you a good man? The test was, would you do your part of the covenant? And then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself, I've sworn. Now get this. It talks about this in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews. So God can't lie. He can't lie. But then he doesn't only not say something. He says, I've sworn by myself because there is no one greater I can swear by. So the New Testament tells us by two immutable things by two things that are impossible that they do not come to pass. Number one, God said it. And number two, God swore it. So if God doesn't do it, he's not God. So he swore by himself and said, because you've done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing, I will bless you. And by the way, again, my favorite translation says it this way. I'll bless you. Oh, how I'll bless you. In fact, I want you to just do that with me. Just go, oh, how I'll bless you. God's not just going to bless you. Oh, how he's going to bless you. Because if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's the promise. Oh, this, we're not talking just little blessings. In fact, the Bible goes on and says that he's blessed you with all blessings, all blessings in heavenly places. All right. So God does so much in the Old Testament. You can see this particularly. And, and if you understand it, you understand that it covers you. But the Bible talks about God, his mercy. And you, you know, you look in the Old Testament, like Psalm 136, it's his mercy, his mercy, his mercy. In the Hebrew, the word there, mercy, is the word hesed, H-E-S-E-D. And it doesn't mean mercy. It means covenant love, covenant mercy, unfailing loyalty and favor. It's because God promised. It's just not a feeling. It's a covenant love, faithfulness, unfailing favor. Jeannie's awesome. But there's been a few times I've been ticked. <laughs> 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 you 
And there's a few times, maybe more than a few, that she's been ticked. But you know what we've got? We've got covenant. We've got covenant. And there's just no way out. In fact, the Bible says it like this. And it's, listen, New Testament, it says, he who loves, his wife loves him, self. Right? When you're in covenant, what you do for the other, you do for your self. You do for yourself. That is the relationship that we have. And again, Psalms 136, you just look at everything God does. And again and again, this is what it says, because his mercy, his unfailing covenant, love, loyalty, favor, endures for ever, forever. And that is the relationship that you and I have today. So literally Genesis 12, Genesis 15, where they make the covenant, Genesis 22, they're all one story. And then the rest of the Old Testament, it is literally the story of the promise line, how God brings the seed of the woman through Abraham, through the children of Israel, through David. It's that story. How does the seed get here? And then Matthew, through Revelation, is God's part. God has to uphold his faith of the covenant. And that's literally what the Bible is. Matthew, through Revelation, God upholding his covenant in Christ at Calvary. And then what happened as a result of that? So that's, that's where we're at. And that's the introduction from last week. So here we go to the new part. <laughs> I can't believe we got there. All right. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in union with Christ or simply in Christ, we all start out in union with Adam. Now, the Bible says this. Romans chapter five, it says that the free gift is not like the offense. The free gift is not like the offense. That's like if you were to say to me, uh, how, do you get to, how do you get to Holland State Park? And I said, well, you know where Woodland Mall is? And you said, yeah. I said, that's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay. So the free gift is not like the offense. I mean, they're, they're, they're different. How many of you know you did not have any say about the offense? You were just born in Adam. But that's not true about the free gift. Because the free gift, you have to choose. And the Bible goes on and talks about how the free gift is so much greater than the offense. So in other words, what God did in Adam, excuse me, what Satan did through Adam is not near as great as what God did through Christ. And you're in union with him. You're not trying to be. You're not one day going to be. You are. If, when, you're, when you receive Jesus, you are in union with him. Colossians 1 verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. Giving thanks to the Father who's qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So God qualifies. You don't qualify because you sing in the choir for 38 years, because you work in children's ministry, because you prayed or fasted, or because you read your Bible, or you gave a certain amount of money. That's not what qualifies you. God the Father qualified you. When he took your unrighteousness and put it into Jesus and took Jesus' righteousness and put it into you. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says that he that knew no sin, that's Christ, became sin for us. He took your condition so you could have his condition. Became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. So I want you to say this, I'm righteous. Now, some of you, your religious, your religious gears are starting to move. No, I'm a worm. I'm a worm. No, you're not a worm. You're in Christ. And God the Father made you worthy. He qualified you for your share 
of the inheritance of the saints in light. Jesus' condition, what he purchased for you, God qualified you. Right? Now, again, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him that knew no sin to be sin, that you might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Let me close with this. Um, how many have ever traveled by airplane somewhere? Okay. You know, you get in there and you're, you're traveling coach. They almost like they're mad you're there. <laughs> All right. You say, hey, how, can you help me with my coach? Just find a spot. Just get back there. You know, just get, get, just get back there. You know, they're kind of mad you're there. And then, but you, you're in first class. Ooh. Help, Mr. Vanderklok. This is your seat right here. Can I help you with it? your coat? Uh, would you like something to drink? Hey, hey, by the way, we'll be serving steak, filet mignon, or chicken, or, or fish. And uh, by the way, we also have a banana split for dessert. Is there anything else that we could possibly do to make your trip more comfortable? Would you like something to drink right now before we take off? Then what they do, they listen, listen, there's this curtain, and they draw the curtain in between coach and first class. If you're in coach, they don't even want you to look in first class. <laughs> it's kind of like you, 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 you use third class people back here. We don't want you. Don't you even look. You're, you're pretty close. There's a bathroom like 20 feet. No, walk 200 feet to the end. <laughs> now, listen, God does not have coach righteousness and first class righteousness. He's just got one kind, right? And that's his righteousness. And that's the righteousness that he gave you. So if you were to die, let's just say you got hit by the beer truck. Right? <laughs> and, you, and, and you die. What's going to happen? Do you need to go someplace for a while? Get kind of like purified? Get rid of your unrighteousness? No, your unrighteousness already got taken care of at the cross. You're ready. You're ready to go hang out with God for all of eternity. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And it's not God's going to give you like a washing over. He's not going to change what he's done in you. Because he's done it in Christ. And you are in union with him. Wow. I don't know about you. So the devil says, yeah, but you did. Yeah, but it went to the cross. It went to the cross. It's already been paid for. Yeah, you may have did what the devil says, but you're not who he says you are. Because you're in union with Christ. And God has qualified you for your share of the inheritance of the saints in light. And then it goes on and it tells us even more that he translated you out of the kingdom of darkness. One translation says, out of the gloom and doom of Satan's kingdom into the kingdom of the son of his love. See, everything that belongs in Satan's kingdom does not belong in your life. Because you're not a part of that kingdom anymore. He sees the sovereignty when Adam and Eve sinned, but Jesus came and got it back for us. He came and got it back. So don't let the God, G-O-D, small g of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, don't let him have dominion in your life. Anything that's of his kingdom does not belong in your life. You qualify for your share of the inheritance and you've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. I want to thank you for being with us today. I want to ask you a question. I want to know about your relationship with God. Where do you stand? You know, culture tells us good people go to heaven. The Bible tells us something different, that none of us are good enough. The Bible tells us forgiven people go to heaven.
Now, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. That means all of my efforts to be right with God could never save me, and all of your efforts could never save you. Jesus said he is the only way. He died on the cross. He shed his blood and paid for your sin. And every one of us need to receive him. In fact, the Bible says in John chapter one, to as many as receive him, to them he gives the right to be the children of God. How do you receive him? You receive him as your Lord, your King, and you lay your life down before him. So uh, if you're not right with God today, you say, I wanna be right with God. I wanna be forgiven. I wanna go to heaven. Then I'm gonna invite you right now to pray this prayer with me from your heart. I want you to, to, to literally speak these words out loud from your heart. Just say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. I believe that he rose again. And I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I hold nothing back. Jesus is my king. He is my Lord and I will live for him. And I thank you. You've heard my prayer. I'm forgiven. My past is gone. And I'm right with God on my way to heaven in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that from your heart, you are right with God. You are forgiven. Uh, I wrote a book to help you keep growing spiritually, and I want to send it to you free of charge. Now, there's information on your screen, and you can download that book. Or if you need a hard copy, if you'll contact us, we will send you that hard copy free of charge. I want to thank you for being with us. God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Dwayne, you are making one of the best decisions of your life. We are so excited for you. Just as Pastor said, we'd love to send you a free copy of his book, Your New Life. Log on to walkingbyfaith.tv and have a copy mailed to you. Download it instantly or check out our new audiobook. You can also find all these things on our app. This book is absolutely free and a great resource for you to have. Walking by Faith is changing lives all over the world with the truth of God's Word. When you choose to sow a seed into the kingdom of God, that money might leave your hand, but the blessing that comes from it, it will stay with you for eternity. If you'd like to become a partner with us, we have three easy ways that you can give. One, text WBF GIVE to 1 888 364 GIVE. Two, visit walkingbyfaith.tv slash give. Or three, click on the giving icon in our app. We'd love to connect with you. When you scan this QR code, you can download our app, send a prayer request, check out our weekly devotional, and stay connected. We pray you have an amazing week, and we'll see you next time.